Welcome to the Empowered Spirit Show. This is your host, Terry Ann Hyman. I'll explore the connection to the human spirit in a way that helps to navigate your life, including crisis. I am passionate about helping you to open up to your intuition and the metaphysical world of spirit to find your confidence in your own inner guidance. Take a pause, be inspired, learn ways to show up focused, centered, and more dynamic in your everyday life. Welcome back to the Empowered Spirit Show. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining me today. This episode is being sponsored by Ritual and Shelter. Are you looking for a magical place to shop and hold space? Check out Ritual and Shelter online or in Homewood, Alabama. Browse through their bookshelves covering topics such as energy healing, crystal healing, Reiki, chakras, auras, the Akashic Records, shadow work, astrology, and earth-based healing. You can also find herbal teas and tinctures alongside their crystals and oils to help establish a mindful mindset and fluid ambience before meditation, ritual work, and reflection. Ritual and Shelter is dedicated to providing one-on-one in-depth conversations with customers to help them find the most efficient healing methods and resources that match their unique interest and energy. They offer tarot sessions, Reiki, sound bowl, and crystal healing, and now they are offering witch consultations. Visit RitualShelter.com to book an appointment and bring peace back to the body, mind, and spirit. You can also find them on Instagram at Ritual Shelter Shop, as well as Pinterest at Ritual Plus Shelter. As this podcast goes to air, we're heading into some very powerful times that is allowing each of us to raise our vibration, expand our consciousness, and open up to a deeper part of who we truly are. We've moved into Scorpio season, which, as I see it, is a magical time that brings us the opportunity to face our deepest shadows, to accept them and love ourselves for them and grow with them instead of pushing them away or shoving them down. This season teaches us how to become more aligned with our own alchemy with the shaman within us, that master energy we all hold. And as we travel to the deepest levels, we find the depth and truth of our soul. As the sun sits in the energy of Scorpio, it brings us the courage to face our whole and complete self and a willingness to be honest about every aspect of our energy. This season already feels intense as we ride the waves of political change and wonder. Which way will that wind blow? And as I see it, we need to allow the cosmic forces to guide us, to help us make those changes, to lift our vibration and be strong with our light. We need to think and act differently. We can no longer hold on to those old fears. Scorpio is ruled by Blues and Mars, which brings us face to face with the raw truth of life and some of its more challenging aspects. Scorpio is deep and it causes us and allows us to go in. We can't avoid it, although many of us may want to avoid what's coming up, but it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The season with this thinning of the veils, meaning that we can evoke a sense of heightened intuition, connection with the unseen, and potential for profound revelations. As we talked about last week, it gives us the opportunity to expand our consciousness, to think outside of the box and work deep within our soul. There are so many ways you can learn to do this. Are you in search of how? Do you need a spiritual teacher, a mentor, someone to guide you to create a spiritual practice, to really learn how to go into your soul, to understand your empathic nature? and to find the ways in which you can release the energy drains and make better choices with your life. My private mentoring programs can help you with that. So I offer you to schedule a spiritual upgrade breakthrough call with me. I have many ways I can guide you through. Let's see how we can help you tune into your soul, your purpose, and show up fully and completely in your life. In today's episode, just in time for Halloween, I interview Paul Wilde about his newly released book, Jim Morrison, Secret Teacher of the Occult, A Journey to the Other Side. 
In this episode, we talk about the creative visionary expansion through a man's music and films, while he was also one who explored mind-expanding substances, hemp, psychedelics, and LSD, we focus more on his breaking the norm and how he used his poetry to express the mystical teachings of the occult. And as Paul explains, Jim did have a reputation as a lewd, drunken performer, but actually... He was a full-fledged mystical shaman figure, a secret teacher of the occult, who was not merely central to the development of rock music, but to the growth of the Western esoteric traditions as a whole. Before we begin, let's take a moment to pause, breathe, and set an intention for this deep Scorpio energy. So wherever you are, if you can, close your eyes. Taking a nice deep inhale, breathing up the body. And as you exhale, breathe all the way down, slowing down. Inhale, expanding the breath up the body. And exhaling, calling all your energy back into you. Call it in, grounding. Inhale, expanding the breath up the body. And as you exhale, dropping right into your heart, right into the deepest part, feeling that connection, your spirit, the greater spirit, creator, God, know that you are loved, guided, protected, feeling all this energy coming in around us as we take this moment to recognize this great wheel of life. Notice, notice where you are, where I am. We find ourselves in the direction of the West for the season of fall where the sun sets, where we notice the cycles of life, the releasing, the letting go. We notice the work that we've done for this year. We harvest it with gratitude and thanksgiving, calling in the directions to the west, the north, the east, and the south, above us, below us, right into the very center, taking a moment, setting an intention for this deep Scorpio energy, connecting with your soul, Receiving the messages of your guides as we call in the masters, the teachers, the archangels opening the heart, the crystal beings, amusement, magnification, calling in that higher self to receive these messages as you set your intentions now. Take another deep inhale. And as you exhale, release these intentions, setting them out into your aura. One more deep inhale, exhale all the way down, grounding with Mother Earth. Feel the heart opening. Feel the illumination of your third eye. And as you're ready, blink in the eyes, back open, coming back. Paul Wilde is a rock singer, songwriter, with classic rock, psychedelic rock, country, and folk influences. He is an artist, poet, and author with a liberal arts degree in history. He lives in Santa Monica, California. So let us welcome Paul to the show. Welcome, Paul. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Yes, I'm excited you're here and to talk about your book, Jim Morrison, Secret Teacher of the Occult, A Journey to the Other Side. How interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's just start out and ask, what led you to writing this book? In 2016, I moved back to Los Angeles from Boston. And I was entering what I now realize was a dark night of the soul. And I had never really engaged in learning about the occult and esoterica. The book called The Secret Teachers of the Western World by Gary Lackman that I discovered in 2016 you know, looking back, and I was just wanting to discover more about who I was and picking a new direction and get back to the things that I was all about. And this is a good time in my life to learn about the occult, to learn about esotericism, because I had never really explored this. And I was looking for the best book on the subject, because there's just so many of them, right? And I discovered Secret Teachers, and I knew just from reading this book that, okay, this this person really seems to speak of the real authority about this stuff. And plus, I, I didn't know anything about the Western esoteric tradition or what that was. And me being a history, you know, I was a history major in college, and I really love history. This book has a it has a historic angle. I mean, just go, this is a tradition that goes back thousands of years. 
right? And the more I began to read this book, the more I, I felt like I was just coming back to life again, the people that I was reading about. And I, I just kept thinking of Jim Morrison, like halfway through the book, and the historic figures that Gary Lackman was, was talking about, people like Hypatia, Giordano Bruno, etc. Their personalities matched this Jim Morrison. And so I just kept writing JM in the in the side of the pages, and it just got to be more and more and more of them. And it just felt like that the lights had turned on about myself and, and about Jim Morrison the more I began to read. Colin Wilson talks about a nonfiction writer that really influenced Gary Lackman. He talks about there's the worm's eye view and there's the bird's eye view. And the worm's eye view is when you're like you're up close to a painting and it's a very subjective dark view. But you have to step back with the, allow the lights to come on to, to see the whole picture, to see the whole gallery, right? So from reading Secret Teachers, that's what that did for me. I was able to step back and the lights came on and suddenly in this in this tradition that's thousands of years old, I could see Jim Morrison's place. I, I could see what it was that he was trying to do in this in this great evolutionary sense. And he has he's a great rock star, right? He has a place um as a the lead vocalist like early on in, in rock history. And then he has a place as an independent filmmaker because that was his original ambition. He wanted to study, become an experimental filmmaker. He was going to move to New York City and work with Jonas Mikas there in the mid-60s after he got his degree in cinematography. And he was able to make a relationship between alchemy and between experimental film. And his, his independent film, Highway, an American Pastoral, that, he, that came out in 1969, I mean, that was like a precursor for Easy Writer. Dennis Hopper was greatly inspired by Morris's film. And he has a place in poetry. He was, he's one, turns out he's one of the best poets of the 20th century. And he left us a whole treasure trove of awesome poetry. So he has a place. His artistic contributions are manifold. You know, he's a polymath, right? He's a Renaissance person. But with the Western esoteric tradition, I feel like I could zoom all the way out. And he has this place in this very long story about people who are deeply in touch with with another reality, the other reality that we cannot see, the unseen world, you know, the the, the, the spirit world, that inner reality as well that that interacts with the outer reality. And these people go through things where they, they don't know what who they really are. They they see that they're very different. And sometimes just by virtue of them just being themselves, they they get into trouble with family and they get rejected by friends and they end up having problems with authority as, as adults. Because these people, they engage what we all go through, like the stormy search for the self. And once they realize that there's just no turning away from who they really are, they realize they have to find a way to, to express themselves. Like they, they need an outlet to show everyone this other reality that we can call that cosmic consciousness as well. And eventually they just lose the fear and find a way to express themselves. And Jim Morrison was this type of person. And he was very, very smart. He saw very early on a way to express these things that are quite primitive is through rock music, which has its roots in the primitive. I mean, if, if rock music wasn't around when, you know, when Jim Morrison was, you know, was maturing as, an, you know, as a young adult, he would have been a painter, he would have been a poet, you know, he, he, he would have been an experimental filmmaker. I mean, a lot of those things that you know, the artists that um, came before him were doing. But rock and roll was brand new, and Morrison was a very artistic, very creative person. And he saw that rock music could be a place where he could put pe like wake people up to that other reality, break on through to the yeah. other side. It's interesting, sure. um, just to kind of take a pause here for a moment, because I do think it's interesting. And one of the reasons I did want to talk to you is because I do believe in music. And I do believe that music is so important to the messages for our children, for where we are, even us. And just, I work in sound bowls. I work in sound healing. And even just the vibrations of energy can help us so much. So I was very intrigued by your book and what you're saying. And as we were talking before we hit record, I am a child of the 60s. I'm Southern rock. And we had so much emphasis down here in Alabama. You know, we had the Leonard Skinner. We had the Almond Brothers. You know, Georgia was big. How many times I went over to Athens and Augusta and just all the rock concerts going on and just really that exposure and back then in the 60s we saw what they say now like the dawning of Aquarian energy and we were trying to open up and we were trying to express ourselves and you know even the early use of psychedelics which we'll get into a minute I'm sure with him but 
opening up and expanding consciousness became very important. And then something happened. <laughs> the world kind of like shut back down, I think, in so many ways. But mm -hmm. now here we are talking about the Aquarian cycle of energy and coming around and more and more work is being done with the psychedelics and more and more people are getting behind how important it can help us in our mental depression, in the state and in opening up the consciousness as well. I think it's so important. So he was way ahead of our time. And yes, there was something about him stepping out of that fear and really being able to be on stage. And then, you know, maybe it went a little too far. I mean, I know some of the kind of like the last I kind of remember about him was exposing himself on stage and getting arrested and all of that kind of energy, which really took him away from some of those teachings. And then, of course, as you know, media will do, gave him a bad rap at that end of his era there. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, how that all came about. But I totally understand about searching and wanting to know more about consciousness, which is what he did. So with everything that happened at the end, I agree with everything, as you just said, everything that was going on in the 60s. I mean, that was the world's first popular occult awakening. And Colin Wilson, you know, he noticed this in the early 60s. Then Random House in 1968 approached him to write a, a book about the occult, which is called The Occult, that came out in 1971. It's a very momentous time. In the Western esoteric tradition, in that sense, people were ready for what a phrase I took from Gary Lackman's book, Secret Teachers, they're ready for that, which is new alien and other. Was, Say that again. So I'm ready for that, which is new alien and other. Yes. New alien um, and other. Yeah. yeah. The post-World War II generation, like you know, the American baby boomers, you know, they were, they were exploring. And in the 1960s, things were ripe for that to happen. And that had not happened at at that level in all of world history. That hadn't happened before. When you read about the Western esoteric tradition, suddenly in the 1960s, and as artists like Jim Morrison, like the lights just come on, that this has a place in a time that happened, and there's lots of reasons why. But towards the end, well, first of all, Jim Morrison loved the South. Like he was a Florida boy, right? He grew up in partly in North Central Florida and he went to FSU. Um, he, in the interview, he said he dug the South, he, he loved the South a lot. And that film that I talked about, Highway in American Pastoral, was actually shown at the Atlanta Film Festival. And he went there with Frank Lissandro, and he loved that hotel in Atlanta where it's off Peachtree. Like, you can see the elevators go up. It was a very novel architecture back then. And then they had to take a drive to New Orleans for a door show because they wanted to see the trees. Because here in Southern California, it's all desert. And there, it's just trees and kudzu. And they're just like, wow, green, you know, and... Really blown away by that. Yeah, Jim Morrison really liked the South a lot. But to go back to the, the whole idea of what happened in the end, Jim Morrison did not expose himself in Miami. That did not happen. They, okay. The American establishment at that time, the Christian right, had their eye on him as a satanic threat. That's very clear. And in Miami, I grew up in Miami with a very conservative Roman Catholic family, so I understand the wall that Jim Morrison hit when he came there. I grew up with this. I understand My, it here in Birmingham. Hello, well, we were yeah. talking about that, right? Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. There was no testimony at all, no eyewitness testimony that, that he exposed himself you know, to the audience. None of the Doors members saw anything like that. That just did not happen. But they took, they saw an opportunity where they could convict him of something they could get him. And he was falsely convicted of indecent exposure. And those charges were thrown out in 2010 by the Florida Clemency Board. But in 1970, they... They convicted him, and then they sentenced him to six months of hard labor. And one of the places that they wanted to send him to, where his lawyers were saying, listen, like you could go here, is Rayford Prison in Florida, which is the most notorious prison in Florida. It's violent. It's a terrible place. So Morrison remained on bond pending his appeal. And then in March 1971, he, he went to Paris with his girlfriend, Pamela Curson, to discover himself as a poet and a person. His lawyers are telling him that, that there's a big opportunity, a really strong chance that he's going to get off on appeal. But, you know, you know you're, I, I've had to walk with Jim Morrison to write this book. And you're in Paris, and you, you're, your name is all over the 6 o'clock news across, across the country with the, the case in, in Miami and, and all that. You know, like you're, you're, a, you're suddenly you're a pariah in American society. I mean, his father was a, you know, one of the most outstanding officers America ever produced. He was an aircraft carrier captain. He was a, became a rear admiral in the Navy. And he actually went to the Navy and said, I'll hand in my resignation because of the embarrassment of my son's cause with all of his, his public arrests. 
So you're Jim Morrison and you're in Paris and your lawyers are telling you like, hey, you're going to get off. But you're like, wait a minute, like I've already been convicted of something I did not do, a felony. And if I lose on appeal, you know, I'm going to prison, you know, and I don't think I'm going to walk. I could not walk out of there alive. That's a very real possibility. These people are trying to corner me into a place where it's highly likely that I'll get hurt or killed. And when he's in Paris, one of the rooms that he stays in with Pamela, his girlfriend, is the room where Oscar Wilde died. And Oscar Wilde went to Paris, you know, to recuperate from two long, hard years in prison in England. And he was put in there because the court felt that he was doing things that were immoral. They're just char- charges based on breaking the mores of the day. And that's not a good omen. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure all of these things did not escape Jim Morrison's mind. Because Jim Morrison was someone who, well, intellectually, when he graduates from college, I realize this is somebody at 21 who has the, the intellectual maturity of a 35, 40 year old with a PhD. Like this person is just off the charts with their, with their intelligence. Okay. So I'm sure that the thoughts went through his mind that his flamboyant rebellion, you know, could get him into trouble with the U.S. government, the family that he came from. And then there's everything that, that he was about and they, they were not about to let the son of a rear admiral, you know, communicate cosmic consciousness and connection with the spirit world to America's baby boomers. It's just too much. Um, a man named Pastor Stagmire came backstage once and, and he said, I know what you're doing. He, he belonged to the Evangelical and Reformed Church. There's a video about that. And Jim Morris is like, wow, what a great name. Like, he's really intrigued and impressed by that. And he was telling him, like, I see what you're doing, but I got to tell you, like, you know, the American establishment really has its eyes on you. You know, this man was older and wiser, so he could see the trouble that was going to come into Jim Morrison's life. France doesn't have an extradition treaty. That's why Roman Polanski, like, lives in France because his war here in Santa Monica, you know, they can't come get him. Um, it's, it's possible that maybe Jim Morrison might have, you know, disappeared or whatnot. I don't think that's really what happened. But he was very anxious. He even told someone, I need reassurance that they're not going to send me to some place like Rayford Prison. This is very serious. He fits the, his whole life, who he was, his personality, the things that he studied and he was into, like, you know, his fantastic artistic contributions and its center on like the unseen world and cosmic consciousness, all of this that leads up to, you know, confrontations with society where they're really making an effort to put him away to stop his career. That's the same pattern with many secret teachers. Oh, yeah, like I you. agree. Yeah, yeah, I study light therapy and what they did with the, the work of Dinsha. And luckily, his family preserved the work. But all that color therapy, no, can't talk about it, take him away. Yeah, I know that. Many people, many people, they've done that work that have these amazing technologies that can help us. And then who gets a hold of it, right? Conspiracies, the the big pharma, like they don't want this, right? And yes. there's a lot of that going on. So then they found a scapegoat is kind of what I hear you say. To go back to what you're saying, I realized that they, they, the, the overall picture, what this is really going on is they just don't want us to, anyone to discover their divinity, their own ability to heal themselves, their own way to find their path this way. Because you, you just, that just renders the entire, you know, dark money making thing, you know, nil. It just, I mean, like we talk about a lot of LSD. LSD was used in uh, hospitals in Canada in the 40s and 50s for people who are suffering deeply from depression resulting from uh, alcoholism to just absolutely phenomenal results. These people stopped drinking and their, their depression started to go away. Like they really felt hope. And, you know, even like here in the United States, they, they tried to use LSD as a truth serum at the CIA. And all they found out was that their agents were discovering God and quitting. <laughs> that, that, <that's> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is so many amazing things that the psychedelics can help us with. And it's kind of like cannabis, too. Look what's going on now in the world of cannabis. I think partly because big pharmacies, well, we can make money off of it, too, right? So now some mm-hmm. of that's opening up. But all the propaganda around it was really just to shut us down and take away that power. And that's the same with, I think, pharmaceuticals. I mean, my whole teaching is based on we have the ability to self-heal. We just have to come back into balance. We need this energy of the subtle body. We need to know how to work.
work with our own energy fields to expand our own consciousness. And mm -hmm. I, I had a near death life experience back right before COVID hit and I did feel abandoned and I did go searching and I did try the plant medicines to try to find out like what is going on. And it took me through many different journeys to where I could integrate all of that energy and really finally feel like a right now landing in my soul landing in who I am, but it was through the consciousness. Now I can sit in meditation and expand my consciousness without it. And sometimes I can use it with it to go a little deeper to help others understand too. But I think all of it is needed right now as we open up mm -hmm. to this whole new vibration of energy. And like, I do feel partly what you're talking about here is like some of that Aquarian energy coming back through. Let's seed it back in. Let's talk about what was happening in the 60s for us. We need to know this. We need mm -hmm. to have these teachers come forward and recognize it's not always what it appears to be. And media may want to tell us. Now, I'm not going to say all media, but you know what I'm getting at. Like the, like the things that block us from the truth of who we truly are. Mm -hmm. So you, to go back to the, the near-death experience that you had, this, this is also like people who go through things like that. that that's a very big wake-up type experience that it radically changed your life, of course. Colin Wilson talks about this, in which like one example is, you know, Theodore Dostoevsky, the Russian author. I mean, he was an okay writer, and then he was sent, you know, to the gulag, and then he was sentenced to be executed. And he got a reprieve literally one minute, but the guns were aimed at him. And then at the last second, they came out and they said that this, this person has a reprieve, but he was ready to die. Like, that was it, you know? And then... That, that experience really snapped him. It really woke him up. And from then on, he became the greatest novelist in world history. Like, it, it's, a, it's a really big change. Like, you're, you're just, you know, suddenly, like, you know, you're in this eternal place where it's like death. And, and it, there's, there's that. And you, and you move away from that. And it really changes you. I think you can completely relate to it. I personally not have a near death experience. You know, also, the, the author Graham Greene, like, you know, he suffered deeply from boredom. And, one day he started playing Russian roulette with his gun and it, it kept clicking and it, it, it snapped him right out of everything that was going on in, you know, in his life. Colin Wilson, he talks about he was going through like a, a suicide ritual. You know, he was really going to do it. And at the last minute, like he had that same experience, like, you know, I, I, I want to live. The whole act of it really woke him up. So all these different types of near-death experiences, they are great gifts they are big wake-up calls like they, they do snap you out of like the lights just start to come on in your life i didn't even realize it because i knew i hadn't died but i left my body i checked out the whole thing and came right back in but i didn't really think much of it and i was in the midst of teaching a reiki class i mean i've written about this now because it took me several years to really honor what had happened i didn't really realize because like i said i didn't think it was any big deal you know, granted, because I do like to travel and, you know, into the astral fields and all, but I didn't really think it was a big deal. I remember seeing my car after I finished my class. and was like, whoa, right? I guess I did get really hit. But it wasn't until really interviewing somebody on my podcast who had gone through a near-death like, and I didn't even know there was such a thing as a near-death like. So I think all hmm. of these experiences can awaken us. And I now know what it feels like to feel abandoned from your soul, to feel like you're not being in that purpose and to be on a search and trying to figure it out. And I also know what it feels like now to land in my soul, to really ground in that energy. What a big awakening it really is. Yeah. And to take some of this like for granted doesn't help us either. It's like, wait a minute, let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. Now let's talk about your book for a moment. How did you mm -hmm. organize your book? How did you write it? Take some of his best lyrics, take some of his best work. First off, like there's so many elements to Jim Morrison, his intellect and his personality. But I wanted to just very clearly show that he is a secret teacher and one of the great ones in the Western esoteric tradition. So I just just stick to this and just make your point because you can go into so many different places with all that's going on. He's just a, such a remarkable human being. And I started with Secret Teachers, and I was a Doors fan ever since I was a kid. So all the lyrics, all of his poetry, all the poetry on American Prayer, you know, I, it was all fresh in my mind. This isn't like I had to do heavy research in someone's writing. Like I just I knew all that. My senior honors thesis in college was a comparison of William Blake and Richard Nietzsche. And I majored in history and philosophy. And partly I went to college because I loved Jim Morrison growing up and I can identify with somebody who is an intellectual like me. I'm sure many, many people saw in Jim Morrison like someone like 
Here's an artist who is connected with the unseen world and that other reality, who's also really bright and really loves books and really loves critical thinking and was a Renaissance person this way. I really could identify with that. And I had a mentor in it with Jim Morrison. I told a, a girlfriend once a long time ago, like, well, I probably went to school because of Jim Morrison. She kind of laughed at me. I'm like, he's a stupid drunk rock star. I'm like, no, he's not. He's much more than that, right? And that's another reason why I wanted to write this book is because I, I kept I'm hearing things in the press and reading things in print that I thought were just very, very ignorant about who he was. Like this person uh, wrote a history of rock and roll book that came out a few years ago. It was like a paragraph blurb, you know, just dismissing Jim Morrison as, as just a nobody in rock. I'm like, that's, that's insane. That, so that motivated me to keep writing. So to organize the book, I knew from reading Secret Teachers and how Gary Lackman structured his book. I, I envisioned just having all the lyrics and all the things that, that he says in, in his interviews, you know, all to, to show this person who's, you know, very much in touch with the unseen world, just to show the reader that secret teachers are, are, are people who they find themselves just by being themselves, you know, in rebellion out in society. And that's largely because they're outsiders. And that's a book that Jim Morrison, you know, really took to in, in high school by Colin Wilson, which mm -hmm. examines all the romantic personalities of the past. And these people just have to find solitude and they just have to, to move away from society to be in touch with themselves. You know, they go through that stormy to the self and the soul, which is that book was by Christine and Stanislav Roth is, is great for going through a spiritual awakening. So the, he was just a classic outsider in this way. So I just wanted to take the reader down the path of what brought him to make the decisions, you know, that he made. And which finally one day, it's just like, you know, the only way for me to reach society, have a place in society, to go forward in my life of who I am is, is to go into rock music. Because Jim Morrison had a Leo North node. And you find your fulfillment in life by going into your North node. Your, your South yes. node is your comfort zone. And yes. I have learned from studying the North node and the South node that you can spot South node comfort zone people. They're outwardly quite successful in everything, but there's just something that's just not quite right. His father quickly realized that his son was not going to go that route. So, but it, it must have been for Jim Morrison, who's lonely and alien from his family, tempting. You know, here's your father. He's this very powerful military officer. You know, I can just have an entire career if I go in my, if my father's path. He could have done that, but he would just would have been a very unhappy person, you know. In the end, that's one of the things that makes him heroic, is that he understood this about himself. Like, I don't belong there. And it must have been something very hard to move away from. Like, I've, to be myself, I've, I've got to get away from, like, this person that I've called the commander, like, throughout my entire childhood. I mean, that's, that's really, you know, heavy authoritarian energy coming your way. But you're this person who is sensitive and artistic, and you feel called to, to do something out there for humanity, especially from these experiences that you've had in your life, such as that you're three years old and you think that the most important thing that's ever happened to you is the, the souls of these Native American workers leaped into yours and that, that one of them was a shaman. Those are, those are extraordinary things to happen to a person. So I really wanted to show the reader, you know, in organizing this book, all the different ways that just makes him heroic, that makes him courageous, that shows that he gave his life over fully to just waking us up to that other reality, to break the circuit as Colin Wilson says in his book, in the, in the Occult. And that's the case that I wanted to make. And I, I very carefully chose lines from his poetry and the lyrics and, you know, the interviews, you know, just to show this person who, as Bill Siddons, the manager for the door, said his concerns were just of another world. And they, they, they really were. And the more I began to read about his life, the more like, wow, this is just truly extraordinary. Like, we don't, we don't see the whole picture. And I became friends with someone named, I don't know what's going on here. I, I became someone, a friend with someone named Bill Cosgrove. And Bill lived with Jim when he was dating Mary Warbelow. He was deeply, they were both really in love with each other. Bill Cosgrove was in love with her, but they were, you know, she was with Jim. The Crystal Ship is written about Mary, and their breakup is, is what originally was Jim Morrison to write the end. But the way that, that Bill talks about Jim Morrison, I, I realize that, you know, this is someone that we, we don't know much about. And then when the movie came out by Oliver Stone, Mary Werbelow saw it and told Bill that that's only 30, 40% of Jim. 
the rest of Jim Morrison's missing. And it's just a, it's it's a very lopsided view of Jim Morrison. Ray Manzarek hated that movie. And what Oliver was Stone the movie? Um, the Doors by Oliver Stone that came out the in Doors. 1991. The one where okay. Val. I mean, you couldn't have asked for two better people to play Jim Morrison, Ray Manzarek, with Val Kilmer and Kyle MacLachlan. Um, mm. It's just it, it's a it's a huge waste of talent, and that film doesn't doesn't convey much of anything about what Jim Morrison really was, sadly. Yeah. Well, gosh, you've shed so much light. I, I have to admit, I did not know so much. And I know even in just kind of talking to hear what people would have to say that I was having this interview and I got one of the, you know, exposed in Miami comments. I got another like, oh, my God, I loved him and growing up. And even yesterday, sitting around outside, like she had the music going. Like once I said that, she's like, I got to listen to it again. Right. So I know I have my favorite songs, you know, mm. Come on, baby, light my fire, that one, and Riders on the Storm, right? Those you could just hear and immediately you know what they are. But I really had no idea about all of this. Do we know how he died at such a young age? So everything that, that happened in Paris is, is quite mysterious. So what we can, what we can learn is that in, in the winter of 1971, things were tough. He had a trial in Miami, the whole thing in Miami. Um, he also had a, a federal trial against him in Phoenix, Arizona for disrupting an airline flight with his friend, which that eventually got resolved, but still that, that put his name all over you know, the news in America. He was putting a lot of money into his girlfriend Pamela's clothing boutique in West Hollywood, Themis, and Pamela Kirsten had a bad heroin habit. So you can see where like managing this clothing boutique was going to go, right? Things like the door is seen is pretty, pretty crazy. And she was carrying on an affair with this French count named Jean de Petui. So Pam moves to Paris first. And then Jim goes to join Pamela in Paris in March 1971. And before leaving, he tells Bill Siddons, the doors manager, you know, I, I really just don't know who I am anymore. And I, I, need, I need to find myself again. And before he left, he was, with all the pressures going on, he was able to leave us some real gems. Like L.A. Woman is widely critically acclaimed that album, the last album in the six album contract. And also, um, this his poetry book, The Lords and the New Truth Creatures came out. That's really, a, that's really amazing. He made Highway and American Pastoral, his experimental film. But then in the end, he felt like he had to get away from Los Angeles. And he chose Paris because that's the place where, you know, all of his, you know, favorite writers, you know, lived like Arthur Rimbaud and Antonin Artaud. And, all, all, you know, all of those people. Jim Morrison's very influenced by these people. A better place to go, re, you know, reconnect with yourself, right? So when he gets there, he takes a trip to Morocco with Pam. He loves Hieronymus Bosch, and he he stands in front of the Garden of Earth. He delights the triptych in the Prado of Madrid for hours and hours. He wrote a paper, and while well, he was at FSU, and he, that he felt that Hieronymus Bosch was an atomite. These were uh, second and third century North African Christians who liked to worship naked in church. <laughs> then he, could just, he, he just felt like what he was seeing in Bosch's paintings was an atom light. And his, his professor at FSU was like, I didn't agree with him, but I was very intrigued by what he wrote. So he stands in front of that for hours, and then they go back to Paris, and he's sick. He's coughing up a lot of blood. Jim Morrison had asthma, and the asthma was coming back, right? Also, just, we're talking about somebody who slammed, like, decades of living into just six years. I mean, he was a butterfly stroke swimmer. Jim Morrison had a lot of physical stamina. You know, this is someone who was built for shamanism and rock and roll and, and like, you know, that, that really struggled, like, you know, against the robot out there, like, for, William Blake calls him mind forged manacles. I mean, this is a really heroic person. But it's the 1960s, and he's the Dionysian archetype. And the Dionysian archetype is a mystical type people who want to basically heighten their experiences with psychedelics and with alcohol, you know? And it's a whole Dionysian thing that's happened in the 60s. And he's, you know, you're young, you're sexy, and you're feeling great, and you're a great rock band, you're successful, you're going to party, you're going to have a great time. Especially if you're someone like Jim Morrison who wants to test the balance of the reality. And so by the time he's in Paris, you know, his health has suffered. And then I just think there's the added great anxiety of, if I go back to America, you know, am I going to be jailed? And am I going to walk out of there alive? And Jim Morrison knows what people like him have endured and gone through in the past. I think he was scared. The last days, there, there is one person that says that they saw him leave the Rock and Roll Circus, which is the big rock, rock and Roll Hangout Club in Paris. 
and that there were these men that carried him out of the bathroom and put him into a car, and she felt that like, he looked like he had died. That they brought him back to the apartment. And the fact that they found him in a bathtub, that's a way in which you try to arouse anyone that's been, that suffered from a, from a heroin overdose. Also, they might have gotten the body buried very fast because Pamela Kersan was helping to heroin. She was a part of that whole, you know, inner circle of like rich heroin addicts, you know, there in Paris. And if the French authorities caught on that he died of a heroin overdose, you know, they, they could put Pamela in prison for murder. So Jim Morrison died on July 3rd and the body was buried four days later in Pierre Lachaise when five people were there. And Bill Sins never lifted the, the, the coffin to check if it was Jim Morrison's body. And Ray Manzarek was like, so basically, for all as we know, they just buried, like, you know, an empty coffin. But Bill Sidham was like a 20-year-old kid at the time. He just felt like the, the, the Parisian authorities were there and Pamela was there, like, okay, Jim's body is in that casket. I don't need to check. It's just like everything else in Jim Morrison's life, last days of his life are, are, are deeply mysterious. And he's interred yeah. in, like, the, the most beautiful, most famous literary cemetery in the world, like... The Parisian authorities are convinced that Jim Morrison did belong in the cemetery, so they allowed him to be buried there. So Oscar Wilde is buried in Colette and Honoré de Balzac. And these are major French heroes with that culture that values literature, right? the poets, right? His soul rests some way, mm -hmm. somehow. And wow, so much of this I didn't know. And so much of it does make sense, too, especially when we try to break through. I mean, like, I can't even compare to, you know, what he's gone through, but I know what I've been through. Coming back to the Deep South, bringing the teachings that I bring and having to be shut down. You can't say that here. Very minor compared to that. But I can only imagine. And it is through some of our greatest artists, right, that do break the bounds of normal, of being safe and really helping so many of us open up. That it is so mm -hmm. important. So I really can honor that you have taken so much time to really explain his teachings and bring it forward. Is there a bigger mission for you with this book? Is it just to get out his information? What would you say is like your driving force behind this? Well, just where it was in, in life these past, especially these, these past eight years, seems to be a time where I've gone through something called rapid spiritual awakening. Just from what I've read from uh, Christina Stanislav Groff's The Stormy Search for the Self, I'm like, wow, I'm going through all of these things. And it was a time to reckon with why does Jim Morrison speak to me like you know so much? And that's why my editor had me write the, the preface of my title, 1717. I've had so many, you know, personal experiences connected to this person. And I was very mindful I was writing. I had to really walk with him to write this book. And I'll be I'll be all day writing, then I go out in public and I, I'd hear like the doors playing. I would be immediately be be, be called to reckon with like the historical magnitude of this person and how many people love him. And so I, I told myself, you can do this, you know, just work really hard and be, make it as clear as possible for the reader. So everyone that has your kind of connection to Jim Morrison, because so many people do, you know, the lights can come on for them in the way the lights came on for you. Just share this this way. To go back to what you're saying about what you're experiencing in Alabama, Jim Morrison discovers the history of magic and the occult as a teenager in Alexandria, Virginia, which is all about the Western esoteric tradition written by Kurt Seligman. And that tradition starts in Alexandria, you know, Egypt, that the city that Alexander the Great founded. And Jim Morrison, he, he really admired Alexander the Great. And it was Aristotle who told him, like all human beings have a very deep, strong desire to know. You know they, they want to follow that. And Alexander the Great was very upset that he had no more worlds left to conquer by the time he was 31 years old. But he did build the city, found the city of Alexandria to foster what Aristotle had told him as a boy, to build this place where people awaken. People like you and me can come to this place and, and we can explore life together and share ideas at the great library that was built. That's a place Jim Morrison would have felt right at home. That's his soul. Hellenistic Alexandria in that library is, is Jim Morrison's soul. I began to realize Jim Morrison was somebody who was picking up where Alexander the Great had left off. You know, he had a thousand books in his room there in Alexandria, Virginia. You know, many of them were the kind of books that you and I have. He was exploring. He was going through his spiritual awakening. And he, he channeled an Alexander the Great-like warrior energy into waking us up with what he did. And that's how he comes across you know, out on stage. Um, and, 
there, there's this connection to, to Alexander the Great that's just extraordinary. You know, Jim Morrison is also the son of a military leader. His father was present at, at the Gulf of Tonkin incident that started the Vietnam War. You know, his father was there when Pearl Harbor was attacked. Alexander the Great's father was Philip II of Macedon. You know, he was a great military leader also. But the connections, they're extraordinary here this way. A little yet, past life energy coming through for sure. Possibly. Yeah, how fascinating. Yeah, it probably mm -hmm. is. There's so many connections for sure. But to have somebody so young and so brilliant and then use music and movies and art as his outlet, yeah, public is going to kind of look at you with one eye, right? Like, what are you talking mm -hmm. about, right? If our music doesn't fit in, but so needed today, so needed to help wake us up. I remember going through COVID going, where's our music? Like, what's going on? What is our message, right? And just to kind of even bring it into modern terms and maybe no relationship at all, but even just the work of Taylor Swift, because she talks about all the bullying and she talks about how she had to go underground for a while and go within and then bringing her force of energy out through her poetry. I think she's a great, you know, poetry too. Now she's gone a little bit more public than that. And I don't think there's any comparison in terms of each individual person, but what we can do with our voice and really recognizing the vulnerabilities of our soul right now and how much this energy of music can inspire us to really ask the questions that like you've been asking, who am I? What am I doing now? These are the questions we need to ask. You can hear my passion come through because we can't stay safe. We just can't. We're in a time right now that we can no longer stay safe. We do need to know. What is it we are opening up for? What do we believe? Not what your husband believes or your mother believes. What do you believe? And what kind of world do you want to see open up to? Very important mm -hmm. right now in this time. So I really applaud you. I could listen to you forever. You are a world of knowledge for sure. Some of it goes a little bit above there, but the message is so clear. So I really honor you for that and all that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, Thank for you. sure. So where can we find you? Have you written other books? Are you teaching? Are you writing songs? What are you doing? So this is my first book, and it comes out, you know, September 10th. I'm a musician. Like, I'm, I'm a writer and a poet and artist. I'm working on a project right now. So that's what I'm moving forward with that. Now that the book has a home, I'm finding a home for the music. When the pandemic struck, there was just suddenly no place you know, to, to play music at all. And I got the idea for this book in the fall of 2019. I actually screenshot it on my phone. I got the idea at 11, 11 a.m. on November 11. <laughs> right. I see lots of number synchronicities. Like there all you of us do, right? Yep. And, and then when the, when the pandemic struck, the day that President Trump like signed into law the national emergency, the you know, poor guy he thought it was going on for three weeks. I'm like, no, this could go on for three years. This guy has no idea. People have no idea what's about to happen. I was like, you know, I'm just going to start writing. And then I woke up on April 10th. I think it was April 10th, April, I think maybe April 14th. I don't know which day it was, but one of those two days. And I said to myself, I cannot write anymore. And then an hour later, I, I got in line. I saw that Joe Biden has signed a law ending the national emergency. Wow. I've, I've learned, I hope everyone that's listening, like time is just something that man has created. There is divine timing. Just to allow, don't force anything. Just allow yourself to ebb and flow and just work really hard. And, and the angelic realm will open doors and, and go into these other places like when you're ready to do that. And I realized writing this book was, was that way. Now I understand what alignment means. It, it took me a, a, a while you know, to understand that. I was on a very steep curve with my awakening. It's, on, it's like, you know, the universe is just like, this person is going to learn quick. We got we to bump him up, right? And I, that's what I asked for. And with writing a book about Jim Morrison, like, you know, I got taken to school. Like, I, I allowed myself to get taken to school. Handling. Channeling, my friend, channeling the energy is how I would describe it. Yeah. And just really tapping Channel. into what his soul messages are for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what a beautiful teaching to come out. And again, I, I think we so need it right now where we are. We need the awakening. We need to understand and understand where messages can come from. We're mm -hmm. not going to find them and where we think they should come from. But it's opening up and being in that alignment, being in that flow and trusting your own inner guidance. So important, which means we do have to pull our energy and we do have to know the energy of our aura. We do have to know that subtle body. Very important for so and again, if, I thank if, you for this work. Yeah. And if beautiful people like you who are, who are going through this, spiritual waking, all these things is it's an enormous thing in you know in people's lives. And if you want a champion of somebody who was going through those things and really want to see what it means to respond to that, then learn about Jim Morris. He's definitely someone that you can look to for that. 
learn about Jim Morrison. He's definitely someone you can learn about that, which seems to be where I was going to ask you as we sum up to leave our listeners with one last uplifting thought. Like, how do you feel this can help to empower the soul, these teachings that he brings forward? Well, response to life is everything. And we are going through something right now that is extraordinary at this point in time. Like we're moving into the integral structure of consciousness, all the past structures of consciousness, the archaic and the magical and the mythical. And right now we're the breakdown of the, the mental rational structure of consciousness. We're leaving the left brain, the scientific method, all that. We're entertaining the right mind in a very big way right now. You know, suddenly in the past couple of years, the U.S. government said, yes, UFOs are real. You know, suddenly all these things are in the mainstream conversation, and that's a real leap forward. At the same time, we have to remember that there's that force that's going to come into play that doesn't want to die. You know, it's just like at the end of the age of Aries, like the Roman Empire, right? Like the Piscean needs to come in, but this is a warlike empire. So for two or three you know, centuries, we had to deal with the Romans and it's a war on the body back then with their armies and the legions and crucifying people. It's a really, really bloody place. People have to remember this is different. All this technology is Aquarian. We're moving into Aquarius. But we also have to remember that we are in the dying stages of, of the age of Pisces. And it, its dark side is asserting itself and it's coming through all this Aquarian stuff in ways that people write, there's so much out there in the culture, it's just going to take you away from your true self. There's so much out there that is going to distract you, that's, that's coming through your, your, your cell phone and your laptop screen and your big plasma screen, that, that's just designed to, you know, to, put, to, to really put you back to sleep. And you have to fight that right now. It's a real fight right now to stay human. You know, there's all kinds of books out there with crazy titles like, you know, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism and all this stuff. Like, it's, it's, it's really intense. And so we're going to break through, but we have to remember that we're just like those people where they were at the end of the Age of Aries, the Roman Empire. It wasn't just the Christians that they, that they were going after. They were going after the secret teachers and the, hermit, and the hermitists and all the other people like in Hellenistic Alexandria. Like, they had their eye on them. They, they just want to remind you that, hey, we're Rome and we're in charge here. You get too much power and we're not going to have that. Nothing has changed. We're the same human race. And right now, all of this amazing technology is, is being used by people that they're not awake. They don't understand cosmic consciousness. They don't understand divinity. And you have to remember that there are people out there that are still very threatened by this. They, they still think this is nuts and crazy. And they, they will attempt, it's just a factor of the heart of life. They will attempt to shut you down. Like everything that you're experiencing in Alabama, not that everybody there is like that, but you know, this comes in all kinds of different forms. It's not just the Christian right or like in conservative America. You know, it, there's, there's other things in the hard left and the left that is like that as well. Don't look to your politicians. Look to yourself. Look to your own divine light within, you know, and then the angelic realm will, will take care of the rest. That's right, Matt. Look, look to your own light within. The angelic realm will take care of the rest. Yes. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. It is very interesting and enlightening to hear this story and the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you much for having me on. Yeah, to your spirit. Namaste. Yes. What a great interview. What a great knowledge of Jim's life and how he channels it to bring it through. And he is so right. We are going through something right now that is extraordinary at this point in time. It is time to entertain the right mind, the creative and intuitive part of us. I agree. We have to remember that we are in the dying stages of the age of Pisces. And it's the dark side asserting itself. And it's coming through in many ways. The creative mind is one of our greatest gifts that you can harness for yourself. We need to move beyond the limited beliefs we place on ourselves and others. As Paul explains throughout his book, it takes courage to break the norm, to be expressive of one's deeper thoughts. Look within you. Find those shadows that are hiding, yet wanting to come forward so that you can release them and set yourself free. Walk through the door. Be a rider on the storm, as Jim Morrison teaches us. As we move through the deep energies of Halloween, All Saints Day, and Day of the Dead, take a moment and open up to your soul and all the lifetimes that you have transcended through. There's so much to learn within your soul. All the links for Paul will be below in the show notes. Be sure to check out his videos and music, One, Two, Three, California. 
And I have so many exciting things coming up that can help you learn deeper about your past lives and how you can move forward with the wisdom that your soul brings you. I have a Reiki Master Spiritual Retreat in Santa Fe and my Winter Akashic Records training, very popular group. If you aren't on my email list, check out my website for the link and I will send you one of my guides, Increase Your Energetic Sensitivity. Thank you so much for listening. This is your host, Terri Ann Hyman. To your spirit, namaste. Namaste.